Good evening. It's about seven after, five after seven. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm so glad for those of you that are here in person. And we know that there are many that are watching online, that are live streaming. Just want to say a couple things about that is you can certainly share the recording afterwards. It will be live and available as soon as we're done tonight. So you could share that with other folks. There is a link available where you can a connect link so that you can register your attendance. It's only so that we know who all is watching with us tonight. So again, if you're someone that's going to watch it later, we ask that you do that as well. So we know who is watching this program. This is the first of three nights. We're very excited to have Leah and Pat Boggs. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But just to make sure we know that we're all on the same page about this program, it is a three-week session looking at finding our way home is the title of it. But it's actually looking at how housing has been decided, how race and housing and inequity are all very much linked. I do not want to steal anyone's thunder, so I'm not going to keep talking about that. But I am excited that we're able to do this and that you all are participating either online or in person. If you want to send questions or if you have questions and you're in on the live stream, please go ahead and just note that in the chat section and we have someone here that is monitoring that and we'll do our very best to capture those questions and get those answered today or next week depending on what time we have. If you do not have a Google account, there's a note on there about what email to send the questions to. And it's john.zink, Z-I-N-K, hopefully you can see that on that, at gmail.com. You know, I've just met him recently. He's back there and he's uh, doing a good job for us there. Um, the other thing I want to say before, we, before I introduce them is we come from a lot of different faith traditions, those listening and those sitting in this room. I would like to ask us to just have a moment of silence, anticipating what we possibly can learn, how we can deepen our understanding, and what it is that we're going to be doing and what we're going to be called to do. Because this is deeper than just learning, which is extremely important. It's about where the heck do we go from here? So let's just have a moment of silence. Thank you. Leah and Pat Boggs will share an aspect of our history. They will share experiences, what they learned, and what they would like to call us to do and to think about. I do not want to say anything more because the, I don't want to do an injustice to what they're going to share. So I'd like us to say thank you for them to, for presenting. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, and thank you all for being here and those online. Um, it's been really interesting to me. Um, we started this as a vacation to New Orleans and stumbled across the Civil Rights Trail, and it not only transformed our vacation, um, it has transformed us. Um, and in sharing our story with our friends, and our Sunday schools, they thought they'd be interested in hearing about it, so we put this together for them. And then some other people were interested in hearing about it, and so we shared it with them. And then they were interested enough that they thought we should share it with you all. So it is, it is our story, um, but hopefully you can learn you know, something from it. So I'm Leah Boggs, as Connie introduced me, and this is my husband, Pat. I'm an attorney that works for state government, and my husband is a retired insurance agent, although he has recently gone back to work. 
um, and we love to travel. And over the last few years, we have increasingly sought out places off the touristy track that will teach us things that we didn't already know, and primarily African American history. Um, because that is, as you know, not necessarily talked about in books. There's not necessarily historical markers, which we'll talk about some later. And so we have really intentionally sought out that places, those places. And so this is how we stumbled on the Civil Rights Trail on our way to New Orleans in November. We had just been to the Segregated by Design exhibit that was at the Lexington Library last year. And we were both moved by it. Um, while we both knew about the housing segregation and red line, we didn't know the government had been the main driver behind this. It was stunning and just hard to believe that it's in the books. But it was with this backdrop that we started our journey to New Orleans. So we started in northern Mississippi with Emmett Till. Is there anyone who doesn't know the story of Emmett Till? I thought I did until we spent a day with him. Emmett Till was born on July 25th, 1941. He would be a young 82 years old. He's 11 years younger than my father and five years younger than my mother. My father just recently passed. He was 14 years old when he was murdered on August 25th, 1955. He was from Chicago, and so this is his house in Chicago. I just actually was in Chicago last week and went to his house and took a picture of it. Um, and I believe they had one of, they had the flat on one of the floors. But, I mean, this is a very nice house in a, a very nice middle-class neighborhood, uh, Bronzeville in Chicago. If you go to Chicago, you need to take the Bronzeville tour. It is incredibly informative. Have a great tour guide, uh, mahogany tours that you have to take. So this is Emmett Till's house in Chicago. Um, his mother um, was a clerk for the United States Air Force and handled confidential documents. Uh, in the summer of 1955, he went to visit, visit his cousins in East Money, Mississippi. So this is a map of Mississippi in the northern Mississippi Delta. So here is Money and then East Money is a suburb of Money you can call it that. So East Money is where his uncle Moses Wright and his cousins lived. Money is where Bryant's grocery store was. Um, Drew is where they took him to torture and kill him. It's about 30 miles away. It took us an hour on today's road. Um, they then took him back to Glendora where they found the cotton gin fan that they used to tie around him and they put him in the river. And then Tutwiler is where the funeral home was and where they put him on the train back to Chicago. And then Sumner is where the trial was. Um, and these are, you know, at least 30 miles away um, from each other. And then Mound Bayou is an African American community and that is where his mother and the African American reporters had to stay during the trial, which was about an hour away from the courthouse in the courthouse in Sumner. So Bryant's Grocery. He and his cousins went to Bryant's Grocery where he whistled at Carolyn Bryant, a white woman who owned the store. Her husband was Roy Bryant and his half-brother J.W. Milam were truckers and they were gone at the time. Um, Carolyn originally said that he put his hands on her and proper propositioned her, although she later recanted this part. He, however, his cousins have admitted he whistled, so there, there really is no question he did in fact whistle. After he, uh, he went into the store, he was alone with Carolyn Bryant for maybe a minute. His cousin went in after him. They immediately left. Right after that, Carolyn Bryant walked out, and for some unknown reason, Emmett Till whistled at her uh, while he was out in the yard and she was passing to her car. Um, the yard was full of people sitting on the porch that witnessed the whistle and the story had started to get around uh, when Bryant and Milam got back to town. Um, they don't really think Carolyn told her husband but that the community was discussing it. As you can imagine, an African American boy whistling at a white woman with a yard store full of people um, was, was big news. So there was a lot of discussion. And in fact, uh, the aunt had tried to get 
Emmett to go back to Chicago. She, she was trying to get him on a train and get him out of town. And the uncle said, well, it's died down. Nothing has happened. It's going to be okay. So several days later, Bryant's husband and his half, or Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, took Till from his cousin's home in East Money and took him to a plantation in Drew, Mississippi, which is where J.W. Milam worked. Um, and this is the top left photo, is this barn on this residence in Drew, Mississippi. And that is a close-up shot. I took it from the road. There's no historical marker. Uh, it is someone's house. In fact, somebody, like just right beyond where I cut this photo, is a driveway, and somebody was standing in it. Um, that is just somebody's residence in somebody's garage. But this is where he was tortured and killed. Um, others, including two African American men, participated in this because they would have been killed had they not participated. They worked for J.W. Milam. He ran crews of field hands. They were forced to participate. Others heard his screams. Others saw them washing the blood out of the truck. I think that's one of the things that stunned me is this, while this was done in the middle of the night and they drug him, God knows, over creation, um, lots of people saw and heard this. Um, it, it really wasn't a secret. Um, in fact, they were, they were pushing daylight you know, to, to try to dispose of the body. So they started looking for a place to dispose of the body, um, and they drove around. They finally decided to go back to Glendora to the cotton gin, and J.W. Milan lived in Glendora right by this cotton gin. So the picture on the top right is a picture of the cotton gin. It now has a museum to Emmett Hill. It's wonderful. If you ever go to Glendora, go there. Uh, my husband, Pat, is shaking hands with the mayor and the founder of the museum in his... Um, his stepdad was one of the African Americans that had been forced to participate in this. Um, it is it is wonderful. So they they take um, and then the the sign just says Glendora Gin. So they get the cotton gin fan. They they tie it around them with barbed wire. They dump him in Black Bayou, which is the picture on the bottom left. So two days later, or several days later, a boy fishing discovered Till's body at Grayball Landing. And this is where Black Bayou meets the Tallahatchie River. It is, it is just around the corner from where the gin is. Um, Emmett was taken back to East Money. So of course you can imagine his family was frantic for these days. These guys had showed up in the middle of the night. Uh, they would begged you know, them not to take him. They'd offered them money not to take him, um, and they, they took him, but they, nobody knew what had happened to him. So his uncle and friends and family had been searching for him for these days. Um, and, and these are all in different counties. So you have different sheriffs, different law enforcement, different, you know, all these things. So um, once the body was found, um, the sheriff, and I forget which county it is, um, they were trying to get him buried in the Church of God in Christ Church in East Money. And the uncle and the deputy sheriff came and stopped them because I guess the uncle had by this time found out that they'd found the body and they were trying to bury him. And the mom had said, I want him buried in Chicago. So the deputy sheriff helped Uncle Moses uh, get the body, stop them from burying him, and, and take possession of the body. So they then took him to Tutwiler Funeral Home and put him in a casket. Um, the platform on the right is the, where the train station was, um, and that is where they put his body on the train back to Chicago. Uh, the sheriff of that county ordered that the casket not be opened. Um, in fact, they had also paced some, paced, placed some poisonous cloth over Emmett Till, so if the casket was opened, hopefully that would have also dis disfigured him. And as you will see later, um, you know, he was really only identified by the ring he wore. Um, so this is the picture of Emmett Till in his casket. Um, they had beaten him. They had shot him. They had castrated him. They had taken an ax and cut off half his face and his ear. He, of course, had then been in the river for several days. Um, 
but his mother said, no, they, people need to see what they've done to my baby. And so she um, let uh, Look and the Chicago Defender, which are African American newspapers, take and publish the pictures. And as you will see, that is very much the spark that lit the civil rights movement. His funeral took place at Roberts Temple Church of God in Chicago, which I also got to see last weekend. Um, this is where the funeral was held. A visitation lasted two days at the funeral home and three days at the church. 100,000 people viewed the body in those five days. Uh, Jet Magazine and the Chicago Defender published the pictures. Um, this church and the courthouse, which we'll see later, are now national monuments. Um, so we did see people stopping to see them, which was nice to see that it's finally getting some recognition. Till is buried in the Burr Oak Cemetery in Oslip, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. It is an African-American cemetery in Chicago where other well-known African-Americans are buried. Uh, his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, is also buried there. She was dissatisfied with the way they were maintaining her son's grave because it was often flooded and she threatened to move him. And this was just last week, so it is clearly often flooded and they haven't fixed it. They promised her many things to say, including a museum. Um, those things never came to pass and the owner has now been indicted and convicted for taking people's money and not appropriately disposing of the bodies. Um, so here we still are. Um, back in, I think, I can't remember when they exhumed the body to do DNA testing, uh, which they did, and they confirmed it was Emmett Till. The original casket went to Smithsonian, where it is now. So we then went on to Sumner, Mississippi, uh, which is where the trial was. Um, during the trial, the black reporter staying in Mount Bayou found that there were at least two African-American men that were witnesses and told the prosecutor. However, the prosecutor could not find them because another sheriff in the other county had arrested them and taken them to jail in another county. And, uh, you know, this is back in the 50s. There wasn't Facebook and texting and calling around and trying to find them. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know how, how much the prosecutor really worked at it, you know, in, in fairness. And in, in some ways, if maybe Till Mobley had not published these pictures and 100,000 people had sh shown up, you know, would these guys have even been indicted? But that they did get indicted, so the prosecutor was forced to take this case to trial. Um, obviously, the uncle, um, Moses Wright, stood in court and identified the two men and said, those are the men that came and kidnapped my nephew. But it only took the jury 67 minutes to find Brian and Milam not guilty and one juror said they wouldn't have taken that long if they hadn't stopped to drink a pop. In the aftermath of the trial, the clientele, so the clientele of Bryant's Grocery was African-American sharecroppers. They quit coming and the store closed. The Bryant's went bankrupt, moved, and later divorced. I think some of you all may have seen, I think it was last year, Carolyn Bryant had wound up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, um, and Shortly thereafter, once she was discovered in Bowling Green, she moved to back to, I think, Alabama or Mississippi and, and died shortly thereafter. Uh, J.W. Milam was known for being a good with, with field hands, but after that, uh, they wouldn't work for him anymore. So he moved around trying to find jobs and both men eventually died of cancer. <coughs> of course, right after they were acquitted, double jeopardy attached so they couldn't be tried again. So they stole their story to, I think, Look Magazine for four or $5,000 <coughs> and uh, admitted to all of these things. Now, Look, for a uh, couple of reasons, got a few details wrong and changed a few details to, I think, protect other people. Um, so it's only just been recently then some of the real details uh, came out, like exactly where the body was put in the river and things like that. So that was our day with Emmett Till, and it was, you know, it, I, I don't want to say it was traumatic because just learning about it doesn't have anything to do with how it felt to Emmett Till. But it, it was palpably 
overwhelming and and physically exhausting and and just difficult um, because we were coming down from Memphis we kind of started at the funeral home and and made our way south and made our way across and um, just thinking about him driving along those roads scared to death in the middle of the night um, I mean some of the roads were not even paved where we went back toward the house where, where the barn was it was they scrape it each year I guess and put rock down but uh, it, uh, it, it it was an incredible sight I'll never forget uh, and just the cruelty that Emmett Till went was abused and, and how he was treated. Uh, we were we were happy to get out of Sumner. But we started the next day in Jackson, Mississippi, at the home of Medgar Evers. Um, he was the first NAACP field secretary in, for Mississippi. He was a war veteran and participated in the Normandy landings. He applied to law school at the University of Mississippi as a test case for the NAACP, did not get in. Um, on June 12, 1963, he was shot in the back while standing in his driveway. This is his home in Jackson. The shooter was across the street. Uh, there was not a house there. There was a honeysuckle bracket that he was hiding in. Um, he usually had police protection and he was followed by at least two FBI cars and a police car. However, that night, none of his usual protection was present. There is speculation that members of the police force were also members of the Klan. I would say that's probably also almost guaranteed. Um, after being shot, he was initially refused entry into the hospital because of his race. And it was only after his family explained who he was that they allowed him in. He was the first African-American to be admitted to a white hospital, but he died less than an hour later and he was 37 years old. He was killed by Brian D. LeBeckwith, a white supremacist. D. LeBeckwith was tried twice in 1964, both of which resulted in hung juries. After his trial, the governor shook his hand and the White Citizens Council paid his legal expenses. White citizen councils are organizations of white supremacists who oppose school integration and voter registration. And they tended to run the towns and territories of, of the South, primarily in Mississippi. Brian D. LeBeckwith was not convicted until 1994. Leaving Jackson on our way to Vicksburg, we stopped at the Bonner Campbell, Campbell Institute which was formerly the Southern Christian Institute and the former home of our own David Lawless, a member of Central Christian. The Southern Christian Institute was founded in 1882 after the Reconstruction era by the Disciples of Christ for the education of African Americans, and it closed in 1953 when it merged with Tougaloo College. Um, the property was then used for civil rights leadership training and other types of educational. Um, David Lawless worked with Medgar Evers and Bob Moses registering voters in 1963. But he, of course, came under the scrutiny of the White Citizens Council and he was indicted, or about to be indicted. And so he was forced to leave with his wife and young daughter uh, to Mississippi. And I still don't think he can go back since I think there's still an indictment hanging over his head. Uh, the property is now owned by the uh, AME and they use it as a conference center. We then went to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, it's an important bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. It is where a major battle was fought that turned the tide of the war. Grant had tried a blockade and two direct assaults from the river and had failed. So he won the city by attacking it from the land side. 37,000 people died, which is a whole lot of carnage to protect the Institute of Slavery. 5,000 Union soldiers died, 32,000 Confederate soldiers died. Vicksburg is one of the first national cemeteries in America. 17,000 troops are buried there, but only Union troops, not only the Union troops from the Battle of Vicksburg, but Union troops from all over the South, they went to Vicksburg to be buried. The Confederates are buried down the road. They're not buried in the National Cemetery. 
It is also the final resting place of a significant number of U.S. colored troops that served with distinction in the Civil War. Vicksburg fell the same month as Gettysburg, Gettysburg July of 1863. Given its southern sympathies, the city did not celebrate Independence Day for 81 years after the city fell. That's how southern Vicksburg is. We then went to Natchez. It's the, it was the richest town in America from 1820 to 1860. It even voted against secession, not because they opposed slavery, but because it was bad for business. You rarely see Confederate flags in Natchez, even though it's very south. It is actually a blue dot in a red state. The Forks of the Road, which is the sign, is the second largest slave market in the United States and it is the destination for most of the people that are sold down the river. The picture on the right represents their shackles. Interesting, Natchez also had a large free black population. The house on the left is Bonchura. It was built in 1851 by Robert Smith for his livery business. He was a free African American who was originally from Maryland. The house on the right is the William Johnson house Mr. Johnson began his life enslaved, but was freed at 11 years old by his master, who was also probably his father. He was working as an apprentice to his brother-in-law in a barber shop, um, and he bought the barber shop, and he taught the trade to free African-American boys. He became very wealthy, and he owned 16 slaves. We made it to New Orleans. Thank goodness. <laughs> it gets uh, not better. <laughs> the picture on the left is the U.S. Naval Station, which was flooded in Katrina and had to be moved. Most of the flooding in Katrina happened in the predominantly poor and African-American areas of town. Uh, when we took the tour, the tour guide said, okay, I'm going to tell you where the flooding started, and then later on in the tour, I'll tell you where the flooding stopped. Um, and we had intentionally chosen a tour that did not take us to the French Quarter and the Garden District, but took us to all the other areas of town. And it was almost the entire, entire tour because all of the um, underrepresented parts of town are the ones that got flooded. So the middle picture is uh, Esplanade. It was the largest slave market in the Americas. It was not one site, but at least 50 sites up and down the street and it's where Solomon, Nor Solomon Northup was sold uh, in the story, 12 Years a Slave. The picture on the right is Homer Plessy Boulevard of Supreme Court case frame. So who can tell me what the holding in Plessy versus Ferguson was? Separate but equal. Separate but equal, yeah. Not quite what Homer intended when he... Um, so he was... Um, Plessy was born a free person of color in a French Creole family. He grew up during Reconstruction where African American children attended integrated schools, African American men could vote, and interracial marriage was legal. African Americans lost all of this at the end of Reconstruction. So Plessy became involved in civil rights, and the group with which he was involved wanted to challenge segregation on trains. The train company also wanted to challenge the rule because of his light skin, Plessy was chosen, and he bought a ticket on a whites-only train car. And he rode around for a while, and at the designated time, because as, as you all probably know by now, these civil rights cases are very well planned out. You know, you, we pick the plaintiff, we pick the spot, we pick the challenge, we, you know, the, the people want to set these up to have the best success. Rosa Parks was not the first person that moved to the back of the bus didn't refuse to move to the back of the bus. She was the best plaintiff that the, I, I guess it's NAACP had at the time, and that's what case they chose to go. So when he announced to the conductor he was African American, they stopped the train, and he was arrested by a detective who had been hired by the group that he worked for because they needed to have him arrested to start the case. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out all like they wanted it to, um, and we were burdened with separate video. William France Elementary School in Ruby Bridges. 
This was the place where Ruby Bridges went to school on November 14, 1960, six years after Brown versus Board of Education. They thought as soon as the Supreme, Supreme Court ruled, schools would just open and they would allow African Americans. Well, that didn't happen. And so six years later, under armed guard, six-year-old Ruby Bridges went to school. We happened to be there the day before the 63rd anniversary. Um, she was, had to be accompanied by federal marshals. Uh, one of those marshals is Jess Grider from Kentucky. He later went on to become the chief clerk of the Western, or the U.S. Marshal for the Western District of Kentucky. Um, not only did he guard Ruby Bridges, but he also, uh, I think, provided protection on the march to Selma. Also in New Orleans, we went out to Cajun country and learned that Cajuns are French Canadian Catholics that were kicked out of Canada because they wouldn't swear allegiance to the British. Some went back to Europe and some came to French Catholic Louisiana. The area south of New Orleans has really nice farmland. Um, it's where Plantation Row was for a lot of, a lot of the plantations. And, uh, but the Cajuns went to the, the undeveloped part and they developed the land and they became very successful farmers. So you can imagine what happened. The rich planter said, oh look, there's land that we didn't know was here that's very good. So they bought all up the land and they pushed the Cajuns further back in the swamp and so that's how we tend to think of Cajuns these days is in the swamp, but they were very successful farmers uh, south of New Orleans and, and still are. Unfortunately, where these pictures were taken at Jean Lafitte um, National Park um, is in Jefferson Parish. And so the pictures in Katrina, when you see the armed guards standing on the bridge and they won't let the people trying to leave the Superdome leave, those are the deputy sheriffs from the Jefferson County Parish because they were just really afraid if all these African-American people came over that there'd be looting. So instead of choosing to set up first aid stations and food stations and hospitals and help and also control any criminal element that might have been included, they just pushed them all back to the Superdome. So I can't really feel too sorry for the Cajuns at this particular moment. We also went to the Whitney Plantation. It's a sugar cane plantation in Edgar, Louisiana, outside New Orleans on Plantation, plantation Row. Oak Alley Plantation, the Laura Plantation, Whitney Plantation are all on the same row. It operated from 1752 to 1975. And when the founder's grandson died, his widow started running the plantation in 1839. It was one of Louisiana's most well-to-do sugarcane businesses, and she was one of Louisiana's largest slave owners by the time she died in 1860. In 1999, it was bought by John Cummings because he realized how little he knew about slavery. He opened the plantation as a museum that focuses entirely on the lives of the enslaved. It's the only plantation in the country that does this. They, they only talk about the owners just to tell you who owned the plantation, but the tour, what you see, what you talk about is the lives of the enslaved individuals. Why don't you take a break? Okay. Thank you. Um, he then donated it to the nonprofit foundation he created, and the money is returned to the local African-American population. The items in the gift shop are free trade items from countries from which enslaved individuals were stolen so that money can also be returned to those communities. And you are forced to confront that when you're buying gifts in the gift shop because it will tell you where they're from and there's maps showing where we kidnap people from. So in these pictures you see the sugar cane bowls, sugar cane, and then the bowls in which it is cooked. And sugar cane is a brutal, brutal crop. I, my family's from Tennessee. My dad's a cotton farmer. He picked cotton by hand. He picked cotton with long bags around his shoulders. He, he had a mule team with the, the mule reins around his neck. I mean, he's, a, he's an official redneck. Um, and cotton's a pretty brutal crop if you ever tried to prick cotton and it makes your hands bloody and it bleeds and it, sh it ain't nothing compared to sugar cane. A sugar cane plantation is where you go when you are sold down the river and you are going to die there. Its leaves give you paper cuts 
and it also contains an anticoagulant so the cuts don't heal rapidly and they get infected. You also have malaria and alligators and water moccasins who our guide told us is the only state snake that actually comes towards you, come, comes towards noise and not away from it. I couldn't verify this on Google, but that is what our guide told us. So that is what you have, that, those are your working conditions. The average life expectancy of a field hand is 10 years after they put you in the field. And they put you in the field when you were 13 to 15 years old. You work 12 hours a day during the growing season and 16 to 18 hours a day during production. All other of these commodity crops, tobacco and cotton, during the winter months, usually you kind of got a rest, not so with sugar cane. You gotta, you gotta produce it. The enslaved population were also injured during the production by being burned or getting their appendages caught in the rollers that they used to crush the sugar cane. One third of the workforce died each season, one third. There are very few women on a sugarcane plantation. There's only enough to cook and clean because the men aren't around long enough to start families. The grounds of the plantation also commemorate the 1811 German Coast Uprising. It was the largest slave revolt in US history. It was connected to both the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution. And that is another thing that I thought was very interesting about being down there. They're so close to Texas um, or Mexico as you, uh, the, the Mexico was just across the river. Um, you're also close to the Caribbean. There was ships coming in, ships going out. So they had news of the Haitian and the French revolutions. There was a lot of free African-Americans in New Orleans and in those places. And so there was um, Spain uh, with Spanish Florida and Mexico had outlawed slavery. So if you could get to a Spanish territory, you were free. Um, in Spanish Florida, you enlisted in the army, so you were free. If you got to Mexico or Texas, you were free. So there was a, a lot of uproar and uprising and revolt and escapes. Uh, some were just into the swamps, uh, but that there was a lot of turmoil. Um, between 64 and 125 enslaved men marched from sugarcane plantations on Plantation Road towards the city of New Orleans. During the two-day, 20-mile march, they burned five plantation houses. 45 slaves were killed in the fighting, and an additional 44 were executed for participating, and their heads were put on spikes and lined uh, Plantation Road to New Orleans. Uh, the middle picture is the statuary on the plantation that commemorates the uprising and what they did to punish uh, the people in revolt. The statue on the right commemorates all of the enslaved children that were killed by slavery. And the statue on the left is an enslaved person yearning to be free. On our way out of New Orleans, we went up the eastern side of Mississippi uh, and stopped in Jones County. You all will know it from the TV show Hometown. It's filmed in uh, Laurel, Mississippi, was in Jones County. Um, I have to confess I stopped there and I bought things in the gift shop. Um, but first we went to Ellisville, which was the capital of Jones County in the, during the Civil War. It was not a large slaveholding county. Uh, I think maybe 12% of the population was enslaved. Newton Knight was a farmer in Jones County who joined the Confederate Army. He was allowed to come home when his father died and he saw that his family was starving because the Confederate Army had taken their food. Not only that, but the Confederate Congress had just given an exemption from fighting to any white man that owned 20 or more slaves, allegedly to prevent more slave revolts. Um, the first uh, Conscription Act, Southern Conscription Act, had allowed you to pay somebody to go fight for you. So rich white men just paid somebody to go fight for them. The second Conscription Act said if you owned 20 or more slaves, you didn't have to fight at all. So this was very unpopular with poor Southern whites. So Knight left the army and he formed a band of renegades of about 100 men and they terrorized the Confederate army. 
he was never caught, but about 10 of his men, they, and they kept, in the middle of the war, the Confederates kept sending men after him because he was such a disruption. About 10 of his men were caught and hung. But he captured the county seat of Jones County. He captured Ellisville, and they raised the Union Jack over the courthouse, and they declared it the free state of Jones. He continued to work for the federal government during Reconstruction. Uh, during the war, he had taken up with an African-American woman, and he had an, an, a family with that woman. So he had a family with his wife, and he had a family with that woman. Uh, there's an awful lot of Joneses, run, or an awful lot of knights running around Jones County. Um, there's a fabulous movie starring Matthew McConaughey called The Free State of Jones that tells this story. As, as I can tell, it's pretty fairly accurate. Um, it tells it in retrospect because one of his descendants was being charged with misinsegenation because he married a white woman and he had some African-American blood in him. Um, but it's a great story of, you know, not, and I think that's one thing we saw is, you know, the South wasn't a monolith. You had Natchez that didn't want us to secede. You had the Free State of Jones. You had different pockets in New Orleans. You had people leaving to go to, you know, Spanish territory. So it's, it was just a lot different than being from Kentucky and Tennessee. I'm, I'm used to thinking about it. So we ended the trip at the National Civil Rights Museum at Lorraine Motel. And I could feel the power of place as soon as I stepped on the ground. And I don't know how many of you all have been there, but almost everybody I have talked to have said the minute they crossed from the parking lot to the grounds, I started to cry. Um, it was very powerful. So as you walk in, you walk in by the sign, the motel room, the balcony, you see the wreath, um, and then the museum is built kind of around behind it. The museum starts by discussing the history of the Atlantic slave trade in the Middle Passage. It shows you how enslaved individuals were packed into a slave ship. It then moves on to Emmett Till. And I thought, I just did this. <laughs> um, and my husband and I discussed, you know, did it, was it more impactful having seen it, having driven it? Or should we have stopped here first and seen it and then driven it? And I, and I think we both decided that having spent a day driving those country roads, getting lost, no pavement, across country, and really understanding all that happened, the movie just couldn't have explained all of all of that. So you s and the driving, going there first. There was a lot of quiet time going between the spots and a lot of reflection. It was probably better we went first to have the understanding. But the museum really shows you that it was the match that lit the civil rights movement. In 1954, you had, you had Brown versus Board of Education, but not much had happened with that. In 1955, you have the lynching of Emmett Till in August. In December, Rosa Parks didn't move to the back of the bus, but she said then, I thought about Emmett Till when I didn't move to the back of the bus. In 1960, you have Ruby Bridges. In 1963, you have the March on Washington and the JFK assassination. 1964, you have Freedom Summer and the Civil Rights Act. 1965, you have the Edmund Pettus Bridge. John Lewis was one year older than Emmett Till. And he was in the South when that happened. And he grew up with that. He was 15. And he said he thought about him at Till as he walked across that bridge. In 1965, you have the Voting Rights Act. 1967, you have the Little Rock Nine. There's a lot of information that we did not absorb, and we need to go back and absorb more of it, um, because the more you learn and put it into context and see how one thing relates to the other and 
you had things happening in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee and the lunch, you know, the freedom riders and the lunch counters and the, you know, we passed going over God's green earth with Emmett Till, we passed Parchman Prison. And I'm like, that name sounds really familiar. And that, I know something happened here. Well, it's where we put the freedom riders. When they got off the buses, we sent them to the maximum security prison in Mississippi and put them on the chain gang. Um, so near the end of the museum, Um, near the end of the museum is a movie showing a group of children of all different races and they ask you, they say what they're going to do for civil rights and they ask you what you're going to do for civil rights. And the very last child is an African American male teenager, about the age of Emmett Till, who says, what are you going to do? And by this time, as my husband and I were it, racking thoughts. And so we think the museum is over, and I thought, well, that's kind of strange because where's the Martin Luther King stuff? So we turn, and you see the exhibit of the sanitation worker strike in Memphis. Martin Luther King was scheduled to speak at the Mason Temple, which is the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ, in support of the strike. And he had already been to Memphis a couple of times to support the strike. But that night, the weather was really bad. And his companions, Jesse Jackson, Ralph Abernathy, we know the story, said, you know, it's really bad. I don't think anybody's going to come. Why don't you stay here? You're tired. And he was going to work on the poor people's campaign. We'll go to the church. Church is about a mile away. So they go to the church, and it is packed. And they call him, and they say, you got to come. So he goes, and he delivers the I Have a Mountaintop speech, or I've been to the mountaintop, with no notes. Goes back to the motel, wakes up the next day. He's assassinated. And after you leave this movie theater, you walk and you see a motel room, and you're like, oh my God, this is his hotel room. And you look down and you read, it's Jesse Jackson and Ralph Abernathy's hotel room. And then it says, turn around, you're standing in Martin Luther King's hotel room. And there it is, and there you are. And you know you're there because you can see the wreath out the window. Um, and there's the three on the balcony. You can look out the window and you see the, not the book depository, but the building where the shooter was. And it is, it was overwhelming. So what did we find that was so impactful besides all that? And what did we think about what our response was? because that young African-American man had said, what are you gonna do? So one of the things that just drove, really became prominent the whole week was what we, ch so first of all, was how slavery scarred the land and scarred the people. Driving through the Mississippi Delta, Western Mississippi, the abject poverty, the uh, depression, the people are just ground down, the land is ground down, There's, it's just a heavy burden. And it is western Mississippi Delta is where, where slavery was predominantly Mississippi. And you could really feel that with the land and the people. But the other thing is how we chose, how we choose what heritage to preserve. So in this slide on the left is Brian's Grocery. This is how well we've chosen to preserve Brian's Grocery. The family that owns Bryant's Grocery and the piece of land next to it, which is the gas station, is the family of one of the jurors who only took 67 minutes to acquit Bryant and Molly. They own the whole town. Of course, money's not a big thing. They want $4 million for Bryant's Grocery. Now, they did get a Mississippi State Heritage Grant for historic preservation but they preserved the gas station next door. 
they didn't preserve Brian's grocery. Tutwaller. Tutwaller's on the Blues Trail. You can see the really nice fancy sign on the right, W.C. Handy and the Blues Trail. It was here in Tutwiler on the train platform that he heard a guy playing the slide guitar and he went back and he recreated the sound and he created the blues. So all the state's historical markers are the Blues Trail. Emmett Till Mem Memory Project has put up these purple signs which are tattered and not sturdy and not, I mean, official. Uh, they've torn the funeral home down. The, the platform is just the platform. But that's how we preserve Emmett Till. Ellisville, the Free State of Jones. Um, the picture in the center is about the secession. You can tell that because it's so easy to read. But it just talks about that we that Ellisville seceded from the Confederacy. Doesn't really talk about it or just what a big thing it was or how there was this revolt and how many people were involved. The, the joke, now it, it is official, I mean it's got the magnolia and it's a, but obviously they hadn't replaced it originally. Jones County Courthouse talks about that it's the Jones County Courthouse and it was built in you know, 1852 or whatever it was. That's all it says doesn't say anything about the Free State of Jones. Now, shockingly, they did have a lynching sign up, so I will give them a little bit of credit for the lynching sign. But, I mean, the Free State of Jones, to me, is a, is a story that I never knew about. It was shocking to me. It was wonderful to know that there were Southerners that didn't believe this and they stood up, but um, they, they don't want you to know about it. Forks of the Road. So we do have an official nice Forks of the Road state marker around the corner down the block. The one at the Forks of the Road is the one on the right. Um, I, I'm very confused. I mean, they had a nice marker, but I don't know. Maybe because it was on a main road. I don't, I don't know. I'm very confused. All right, Pat, who's your favorite to talk about? Oh, my favorite. The uh, Riverside signs amazed me where we were where we ran into it and I was all so impacted by the uh, continued hate in the area. The Riverside of sign of Emmett Till which was installed in 2008 was repeatedly vandalized and you can see that on the right. It was constantly having to be replaced. The uh, students from um, Ole Miss would come by and shoot it up blow holes in it, and finally um, one of the fraternities decided to pose with it. So their fraternity, national fraternity, kicked them out of the fraternity, but Old Miss did nothing because it wasn't on Old Miss property. Um, in 2019, they installed the bulletproof sign which is the black one you saw in the first slides, and the landowner has given the Memorial Commission a long-term lease. So, and I won't tell which fraternity it was that suspended the boys, but their favorite uh, member is uh, Robert E. Lee, so. How we are still impacted. My husband and I thought a lot, like he said, we had a lot of miles of quiet reflection about how we are still impacted with economic disparity and wealth inequality, placing freeways and toxic waste dumps in African American communities. And once you start to pay attention, you see how all the freeways in any city you go to, go right through the African American community and create a very hard boundary between the African community and the white community. I tried for a week to get a map of New Orleans, all of New Orleans, but I could only find a map of the French Quarter and the Garden District. I tried the same thing last weekend in Chicago and I got downtown and near north. I didn't get the south side, I didn't get the west side. Another way we are impacted are the gerrymandered voting districts. I have 
to say one of my first thoughts was when they asked me, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'm going to be like David Lawless. I'm coming to Mississippi, and I'm going to register voters. Um, and, they're, and they're dealing with their voting district. So on the left is the mass map of Mississippi in 1860, and the darker areas are the, um, the count slave counties that had the most slaves. And so on the right, you can see uh, the four congressional districts. And so there is a challenge to say that you need more African representation in Congress. Only one of them, number two, is an African, predominantly African-American district. So uh, the Mississippi Commission keeps redrawing it, and on the right is their proposal. You can see they just made two bigger, like they didn't make another district. Um, so that is, that is still in court. Alabama, you may have heard Alabama is also going through redistricting. On the left, uh, the blue counties are what they call the black belt. Those are the pr predominantly African-American counties in Alabama, uh, predominantly slaveholding counties. Um, and these are, I think Alabama has seven congressional districts, and for years only one of them was predominantly African-American. And as you see, they just tried to make that one bigger. But that one is also in court, and the court is forcing them to take that and break it into two. So there will be two predominantly African-American districts going forward. Having just seen the segregated by design exhibit at the library, <coughs> traveling through Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee, uh, it felt like a dam had broken and just flooded us with all these little bits and pieces of history that we should have known that we've never been taught. Uh, and it was our first real understanding of, of this brutality and the slavery that and it just absolutely dug into my soul. And it continues this day down there. Uh, along with the oppression, both economic and other the abject poverty and desolation of western Mississippi showed the scars, and Leah had already alluded to that, talking about it. So it was just what an impactful visit, and to just have that much time traveling with just the two of us in not much conversation. It's just, it was all reflection, and it hurt, and I could not tell you how happy I was to get out of those states. We couldn't get out fast enough for me. Um, so it all, you know, part of our reflection was that um, it all started with the doctrine of discovery in the Papal Bull of 1493, which said that any lands not inhabited by Christians were available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited, and exploit and claim we did. It is enshrined in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. And our white settle, settler colonialism and economic oppression is baked into our laws and, our, and I think actually in our DNA. I mean, one of the things the Whitney Plantation talked about is after Reconstruction, um, they started sharecropping. And they started, you know, company stores where by the end of the day, you owe the company more money than you've worked off. We just find more ways to have slavery, and we do it now with our wage oppression and work and labor laws. And like we can always, it just really seems like white people can always find a way to oppress somebody for money. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what our responsibility was going forward. And, and as I told you, my first thought, David Lawless, going to Mississippi, I'm gonna register voters. And then I realized I could, I could do that here. Um, that and so where we landed was housing and and political uh, political activism i work for state government and housing activism i mean we really saw housing inequality and and there's a lot of with the segregated by design there's a lot of good work being done by cities but also private and nonprofit to really how do we fix ha housing segregation we created it we have to fix it so how are we going to do that and the question that we ask ourselves is, what are we going to do? But my question to you is, what are you going to do? Good job.
and I'm happy to thoughts, questions, comments. Well, as I was saying, I just am so impressed with how a couple would take the time to take such a trip. I think that is something we all need to consider. Um, a couple of things I thought about. One of them, when I was sitting, at, you know, our church had, as they said, what was at this time the Southern Christian Institute, which had been there forever and was on the place where we had a so many things like even Brea College or other places, um, you know, you had to have an ability to have a farm as part of your place because you had to be able to produce your own food. You couldn't be caught in a situation where the community could just uh, starve you to death. So Mount Beulah, I mean, our Southern Christian Institute had a big farm that was there in addition to the with a wonderful boys dormitory, girls dormitory, a big administration building which he had a picture of, and a dining hall, and everybody that worked there had to have a house there. Some of you know Ozark Range, who used to be uh, the preacher at one time at, at Second, you know, historic Second Avenue Christian Church. Um, and um, people like that were, were just really all on, lived on the grounds, as, as my first wife Jane and I did in the mansion. <laughs> we, we inherited a mansion from somebody that gave us the land. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, I was sitting there in my office one day and up drove Bob Moses and Medgar Evers and several others. And uh, Not they everybody can use that in a sentence. But I was an adult. <laughs> uh, but, I, but they said, David, we have a job for you. And that's when they said, we would like to begin to bring people into this wonderful facility you have. And one of the churches, the reason the church had sent me down there was to figure out what to do with all that land because as she said, we had merged Southern Christian Institute with Tougaloo. And the reason we had done that is that there was no institution of higher education in Mississippi that was accredited that served I black people. That that served African Americans. None of them that served African Americans. The state schools like Jackson State, Hitabina, Alcorn, all those places were not accredited. But by merging SCI and Tougaloo, we were able to get enough uh, strength in our faculty and our library and everything else. We moved all of it to the Tougaloo campus uh, and we were able to get to the first thing that was accredited by the Southern Association was Tougaloo because of that. So we play an important role in that too. But then we had, they sent me down there to figure out what to do with all that land. And um, we started doing things like we began to use our farm to train black farmers that were, there were by that time some people, black people who had inherited some way or another a little piece of land that they were farming, but the Department of Agriculture wouldn't do anything to help them. And so we began to, to train people how to improve their farming skills. And I got a guy from, that was a Kentuckian that had grown up at, uh, in Kentucky and had, had gone to the agriculture here to come down and direct that program. But as I said, I was sitting there and all of a sudden Bob Moses and Meg Rivers and others drove up and they said, Dave, we have a job for you. We wanna use this wonderful facility to actually tr bring young people in from all over the state since you have dormitory space and all this, the dining hall and everything, we're going to bring them in here and teach them how to go back to their community. And he said, we're never going to use the word voter registration. That will set up a red flag. We're going to call it citizenship education. And we're going to teach them how to go back to their community and create in their 
among their own people a way to understand the importance of voting, the importance of becoming an active citizen in your community, and to really train them in how to do that. And so we began to bring in these young people to do that. And that's what became, later as she mentioned, the Freedom Summer, because that started building. So really, our disciples had a great part in putting together what became known as Freedom Summer. And I don't, it was interesting, our church was not very sure, Adel Fires at the time, somebody remember him, and others, they, he was not sure that, they, they said, David, you're creating a lot of problems down there. And then I got called before the grand jury and I was you know, indicted on one to sedition and one a conspiracy and six counts of integration laws. And they said, we're gonna fire that guy. And uh, so they, but I, the thing that was interesting was that because of that, we've never talked about it very much officially in our church, that we played a major role in the civil rights movement and the church didn't want anybody to know about it because the white church didn't like we were doing it. Um, just one other quick story. Uh, you talk, mentioned about uh, one of the communities you mentioned. Um, you said it was a nice community. Natchez. Natchez. Bob Moses and I were at an uh, African-American church one time in Natchez. And um, we were sitting there talking to them about what's going on. And, you know, everybody's being called a communist. And this gentleman got back in the back of the church and said, I don't know what a communist is, but if Bob Moses is a communist, I want to be one too. <laughs> well, tell, tell them how you managed to get yourself indicted about communism. <laughs> well, it was, they, <laughs> we had, I, because of that story, I got interested in the fact, I said, I wonder what African Americans generally know about communism. They're all being called communists. You know what communism is. And what, and so I did a little survey form that I was giving to our students and just to see what they thought about, you know, what is communism, and um, and try to help them understand socialism and communism and, and, and the free enterprise system we have. And um, somebody got a hold of that and leaked it to the Clarion Ledger, the big newspaper in Jackson, and they put a headline, and I was out of town at the time, and I called home, and, and my wife said, David, they're looking for you because the Clarion Ledger says, lawless recruiting communists at Mount Beulah. <laughs> 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 so that's what started the whole graduate. And you know, I had been, you mentioned the White Citizen Council. Uh, some people call it the Ku Klux Klan, but that's different. But the, uh, the White Citizen Council was that reformed movement that really did, as she said, run a lot of things. And I knew them, and I, when I wanted them to feel okay about the things we were doing out there, because I didn't want them to, we were a gated community kind of out of town a little bit, so they could leave us alone. So I would keep going into town and tell the White Citizens Council, don't worry, we're doing nice things out there. We're just helping these people have something to eat and you know, have some clothes and doing some literacy training. So don't, you know, we're not doing anything controversial. And uh, then, uh, then I got called before the grand jury and I looked up there and that was all the White Citizens Council sitting in the grand jury. <laughs> well, thank you so much for working with us. Well, um, that's a good question. Um, I'm hoping that our segregated by design uh, people, and then I know Lexington City Council, um, as you may know, you know, Lexington and Louisville both passed ordinances that uh, said uh, you can't, you, in, income discrimination in Section 8 vouchers, that, that landlords can't discriminate. Uh, if a tenant has a Section 8 voucher, they can't refuse to take it because that is one way that we're concentrating poverty and concentrating 
uh, predominantly African Americans in certain sections of town. If we really want to be integrated, then you shouldn't be discriminated against because you have a Section 8 voucher. So Louisville and Lexington passed those laws. The state legislature came in, and even though they believe in local control, they said, no, you local, local uh, places, ordinances, can't infringe on a landlord's right to decide what kind of money they want to accept. So uh, there's also, um, and I'm hoping the city council can explain, you know, ways around it. Uh, one of the ways around it is for private, for nonprofits to um, fund uh, down payments because, uh, because we were so horrible and didn't give African Americans loans all these years, they don't have the inherited wealth sometimes to uh, have a down payment even if they can make the mortgage payment. So is there, uh, can we use the Section 8 money or is there private nonprofit money that we can use to uh, loan or grant uh, down payment assistance so that we can start to in integrate other areas of town. So um, I don't have those good answers, but um, our, after we did this, our Sunday school class read the color of law and then just action. Um, and I, it's my understanding segregated by design is, is also looking at those things because, um, and it's, you know, it's small things and it's individual things. And do we, uh, my husband and I are blessed to own some rental property and and we have talked about, you know, we have tenants now, but our next tenants, maybe we need to make sure that we look for somebody with a Section 8 voucher or we, we look, you know, for an integrated, you know, a way to integrate the neighborhood and that that's our individual activism is that we take our rental property and we forcibly integrate it. Um, do we encourage other people in the church to do the same? Are there developers that are in the church that, you know, one of the ways to do help with income inequality is to do set-asides. If you're building an apartment building and there's 30 <coughs> apartments and you could set aside 10 for market rate, 10 for medium market rate, 10 for low, um, low income, um, does the church encourage that? Can, can the church create a fund? This church has always been very interested in housing activism and affordable housing you know, how do we support that? How do we talk to our city council about supporting, making sure all the development has uh, mixed market rate housing so that we are, we are integrating it both racially but also economically um, in areas of town. So I will tell you, I don't know as much about that, but I, I know some ideas and that's why I wanna talk to city council. I know our city council is actually trying to address some of those things. but I want to make sure that people can hear the question that is that they're online and I can't or if you want to repeat you were talking about bills why don't you get up and just it is something that that the church is supportive about one of the things and several of you were at the bill build, build rally last night I mean I, I'm looking and seeing the people who were there um, Build worked, Bill Embry, who was a, a late member of this congregation, worked for years. When I first came here, it took him six years working with Build, talking to the city, and demanding over and over that we get an Affordable Housing Act. They finally got an Affordable Housing Fund. This year, they have finally gotten passed an ordinance that the Housing Fund has a dedicated funding stream it's only one percent they want it they, the the how the affordable housing would like five percent of the money that the city uses for taxes but they have one percent and so they have maybe five they got five million dollars and they're now housing over three thousand more families so they're building and renovating a lot of apartments that's one of the things that's happening locally there are other things that BUILD is doing locally for 
for, for the people of Lexington. You know, I can tell you other things and we won't, but housing is one of the primary things. Right now, they're sitting back on the housing issue a little and taking just the 1% because they're supposed to do a housing survey in Lexington. Have not had a housing survey done in this town in 10 years. There's supposed to be a new housing survey done this summer, which then will give a better idea of where these apartments are being built and whether they are being built in places that have access to li livability, to transportation, to uh, grocery stores, to the kinds of things, because if you build it right out here where nobody can use it, then you've wasted your time. So there's a survey that will happen. And Bill will be keeping an, ac uh, keeping an eye on all of that. So keep, your, keep, keep watching what Bill is doing. The one pitch is, uh, we had an, a rally last night when they gave reports on the three issues that BUILD is doing. One is housing, one is microtransportation, which is uh, the wheels, the, the transportation uh, for wheels and um, Lextran in this city is not good. If you've ever tried to get around, it doesn't work well. Microtransportation is neighborhood by neighborhood of people who can get a ride within half an hour to go to a doctor's appointment and who don't have to w make the appointment the next day or wait an hour. The third issue is seniors, elders, who want to stay in their homes. How can they recreate villages that support communities, that help them with uh, housing, that help them with affordable housing, that help them taking care of their house, that help them with other things that keep them in their homes so that they're not being kicked out and that's one of the senior things. So that was the rally last night. The Nehemiah action will be on the 30th of April. It will be at the Center, Center Bank Center, which I still call the Convention Center, It'll be at seven o'clock. And we will be talking to political leaders in this town, presenting proven solutions, researched solutions of things that will work in this town. And we have the image of how affordable housing finally got started and it was because of this church and Bill Embry and Build. And how many people do you need? We need, we're supposed to put out, somebody asked me, Daylene says, what is 52 to one? Bill's goal is any church that is interested in justice would bring out once a year an average congregation of how many people come 52 times a year to our church. We have maybe, I don't know, 300 people so the goal is that we don't get 30 people, but that we get 300 people the same as come to our churches. And so that's the goal. And so we have a goal of 1,500 for that a rally, uh, for the Nehemiah action. And we will be taking, for those who are interested, we will be taking comments and reservations and passing out tickets to that at the church, the red table, for the next three weeks. So I'll also say regarding political activism, you know, we, we live in a red state. We live in a state that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we're blessed to live in Lexington where people want to do things like this, but so far the state legislature doesn't agree. So, you know, I think we have to be sneaky and we have to be creative and we have to be thoughtful. If we can't do it publicly, then how do we do it privately? How do we have nonprofits? How do we have those kind of actions um, whether it's the bully pulpit or talking to our friends and neighbors, the affordable housing trust fund, you know, all of those things, you know, um, maybe, maybe when we pass away, we leave our rental property to the affordable housing trust fund. Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do you, how do we get more buildings in there for them to do those things? So that's, those are the things we're thinking about. Um, other political activism, we have to be sneaky and creative. And, you, and, and I, I take a lot of heart from the civil rights movement. Um, and I know um, we feel like we've uh, made two steps forward and three steps back in America. But think about 1955, think about 1963 with David Lawless in Mississippi and think about how far we've come since then. So don't, don't lose heart. And you know, they took to the streets and they put their bodies on the line and they got people together and they did it. We can do it. It's, it's been done before and, and we can do it. So don't, don't lose heart. 
Um, there is an online question, but before we get to that, I will say, well, I'll answer the online question first. So the question was, having been on this trip, how to feel about reparations? I absolutely believe we, we owe reparations. Um, I, how you calculate it and what you do is very hard. Um, but having read The Color of Law and, and seen how we denied mortgages to African Americans, uh, how about we just take the present value of whatever, if you'd been able to buy a home in 1950, what that value would be today, and how about we just give you that? You know, it, there's never going to be a perfect solution. How about we give free college educations or free technical school educations? Uh, how about we give you what your house would have been worth if you'd been able to allow, you know, buy one? I don't know the answer, but that seems like a place to start. We pay reparations to Japanese. You know, we need to think about reparations to um, Native Americans, but we, we certainly know how many people, whether they, they probably didn't apply for a mortgage because what would have been the point? We, they would have been denied, but we certainly know um, ex African American households in 1950 would have applied for a mortgage if they could have gotten one. How about we just do that? Um, the other thing I was going to encourage you to do, uh, we literally stumbled across this. We knew we wanted to go to the Lorraine Motel, and so we started Googling around what else might we want to see. We ran into David Lawless, and he said, well, go, you need to go to the Southern um, Christian Institute. Um, thought, well, there's Medgar Evers and Jackson, and I'm... I'm a person that when I decide to go on vacation, I stalk the places. I'm going to go on YouTube and I Google who else has been there and little known things to do. And I found there is a U.S. Civil Rights Trail uh, and Mississippi has its own Civil Rights Trail. Uh, we did not get to all of the things on there, but uh, we want to go back. Uh, the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library is at Mississippi State. Like, who knew that, right? Um, still is perplexing to me. But, um, you know, just look around. Um, when I went to Chicago last weekend, we Googled African American tour, Southside tour. We found a Vider tour, and it just, we stopped at a soul food restaurant. It, like, it just read like white people taking us on a tour of African American. It just was like, that's not what I want. So we found Mahogany Tours, African American owned, African American led, follow him on YouTube. Uh, he is a YouTube sensation. We started at the DuSable Museum, the first African American museum, I think in the nation. Um, so find these places, spend some time and look for them. Uh, support African-American owned businesses and tour companies, buy things at the museum, um, you know, that helps a little bit. And then talk about it. Tell your friends, hey, when you go to Chicago, you need to go to the South Side and, you know, you need to do these things. Also got to go, uh, John, I haven't told you this, but we went to Trinity United Church of Christ, um, Dr. Otis Moss, preaching for Easter. So uh, it was quite the show Pat watched online. Uh, I had been there back in the 80s when Jeremiah Wright was preaching, Obama's pastor. I think I still have a letter from him, his welcome to the church. Uh, it's the church of the staple singers, Oprah Winfrey and Obama. Um, go on Easter, it is rocking. So. Anybody else? Well, thank you all very much. Yes, I can't say thank you enough, and we also appreciate it, and I know folks online, hopefully you get your questions answered, or if you have any thoughts later, certainly send them to, to John, the email that's there, um, and we'll certainly get that. I want to tell you a little bit about the next couple weeks. We've mentioned, she's mentioned Lexington, segregated by design. That's coming, she's coming next week, uh, Barbara Sutherland and Rona Roberts. And they're going to come and do their presentation about what's happening in Lexington. It's about redlining. It'll be more about Lexington. And then the third week will be uh, James Brown, Councilman James Brown. James Brown's going to be here and 
Charlie Lantern, and there's some others that might be coming. And that's going to be more of a panel discussion, looking at what can we do, what is the city doing. The vice mayor, she was instrumental in getting some of those folks on board with maybe coming to the panel session and participating. Um, and the vice mayor, who has a lot of information and has spearheaded some of this, he will be out of town, so he's not going to be able to be here. But um, we'll have at least two people, maybe three or four, that can speak to even more so maybe what more can we do here? What's happening in Lexington? So the, the whole idea is that these three sessions build. It doesn't mean you have to come to everyone in order, but it does help you to get an idea of where we're going. So any questions about that? Anything? One more round for them. I'm so glad. Thank you. Well, it's been interesting. The tech was the most interesting for me, so <laughs> I'll just say that. The most challenging. Okay. Have a good night, you all. Peace.